Intersex is an umbrella term used to describe bodies that fall outside the strict male and female sex binary. Now, people who are born intersex are usually faced with stigmatization or ill treatment purely because people are just not educated enough about this topic. So, today we have Intersex Rights Program Officer, Crystal Hendricks, right here on WQMD. Welcome, and thank you so much for being here with us, and thank you for your time. Um, you know, for me, it's quite interesting because um, I only really learned about intersex recently in my adult, in my adulthood. See, I've always known there was an I, mm. an LGBT, mm. right? <laughs> but never did I ever investigate or, or read up more about it. And, um, and only recently I, I attended, a, it was like a film screening. And one of the documentaries were about intersex individuals and their journeys. And then it clicked. And we had already started WKMD then. And I was like, why are we not speaking about this? Why do I have absolutely no knowledge about this topic? And um, do you feel the same way when it comes to, to speaking about this, uh, this particular topic? Yeah, I, I think um, with, with intersex and people being intersex, um, like we said, right, it's an umbrella term um, for people with different sexual characteristics um, that doesn't fit binaries, right? Um, some intersex traits are visible at birth, some are not visible at birth, and oftentimes some people don't even know they are intersex mm -hmm. up until when they go through puberty at like 15, 16, they might not even know the intersex, they just will know their bodies are developing differently. And then when they reach adulthood and, you know, struggling with infertility or different ailments and, you know, and then they discover that, um, oh, through testing that I'm intersex. So I think why a lot of people are not talking about intersex is actually the way how intersex people are being dealt with, right? Mm -hmm. um, so firstly, from uh, the medical um, system, right? Um, the medical system is basically <laughs> trying to erase intersex people, you know, um, through unconsensual and unnecessary medical surgeries. And because of these surgeries gets done either at birth or when you are very young and, you know, you didn't give consent to this, Sometimes intersex people only find out in their 20s, in their 30s, that surgery was performed on their bodies and they wouldn't even know. So why we are not talking about this is because the medical field is trying to erase intersex people. Surely that's unethical. Uh, can I, can yeah. I interject for two seconds, yeah. Crystal, just from the very beginning, for all of us present and the viewers at home, what is intersex? Yeah, it's, it's like we said in the opening, right? So intersex is, is an umbrella term. Intersex people are people that do not fit the typical binary notions when it comes to male and female, right? This could be many different things. It could be chromosomes, it could be genetics, it could be external genitalia, it could be internal sexual reproductive genitalia. So it, it could be many other things, right? I think in school when we when we grow up and um, when we in biology class, we get told that uh, men has X, Y, chromosomes and woman has XX chromosomes, right. right? I'm an intersex woman with an XY chromosome. So that proves that biology is, is wrong mm -hmm. because um, chromosomes are not linked um, to certain categories of sex, right? Um, gender is also not binary. It's, it's on a spectrum and we are just not told these things. So there's many, I think there's over 40 variations sure. wow. <laughs> of how someone could be intersex. So that means no two intersex people are the, sa are the same. Like they are very different and they also face, you know, different violations as well. When did you realize that you identify as intersex? <sighs> well, I didn't know. So for me personally, um, when I eat about 15, 16, I never went through puberty. So I never got a period, but everything was fine. Um, went to um, a doctor, um, got referred to a hospital, to a gynecologist, and um, 
went through a lot of scans and testing, you know, for an entire year, feeling like a complete medical experiment. Um, because I feel like the moment a doctor has an intersex case, they get excited. Um, they want to share it with their colleagues. Um, I had many instances where I was in a room, a 16-year-old, naked with about 15, 20 doctors around me because they're all very excited about <laughs> this person is a bit different. Um, they did a lot of testing and then it was discovered that I was born without the uterus. So no uterus, no fallopian tubes. Um, and at that time, the doctor said, um, I have ovaries. They said I have ovaries internally. Um, and they explained to my mother that they could become cancerous and they had to be removed, you know, which I know now is a lie. But at that time, 16, knowing nothing, I was like, okay. And my mom was like, let's have the surgery, let's have it removed. And after that, I continued my life, right? They put me on hormone replacement therapy, which I didn't even know what it was. Um, I mean, I was 15. They mm. said, yes, estrogen, and you have to take this tablet a day. And yes. I was like, okay, I should do what the doctor says. Um, and my life went on, right? Um, when I was only in my 20s, and you know when you go on Dr. Google, mm. and <laughs> I was typing things about like my intersex experience. I was like typing things like no uterus, no that. Like I was typing things in and... Um, Google said something about complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, like such a big word. Mm. Um, and um, that was basically a diagnosis. And I then went to the doctor, asked for referral. They referred me to an endocrinologist because they do more in depth, like hormonal, mm. genetics, mm. and chromosome testing. And I mean, I was like <laughs> almost 24 at that stage. Um, I went through the testing and after all the testing, the endocrinologist informed me that, well, like they had a whole book, you know, of all these intersex variations and they don't call it intersex, right? So the medical field, they call it DSD. So they call it the disorder of sexual development. So there wow. they're already wrong because they are saying intersex wow. people are disordered. Yeah. 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 So that, that's messed up, right? And so they call it um, DSD. They've changed it now I mean, the last two years and they now call it differences of sexual mm -hmm. development. But however, why should it be a difference? Yes. Why sh It's just a normal, yes. like people are just born intersex. Um, and then after my testing, the doctor told me my chromosome pattern is like XY. And as for their research, um, I didn't have ovaries, but it's, I had internal, they call it gonads or testes. Mm -hmm. um, that was obviously undescended, that was internally. And technically, this testes were producing the hormones, right, that my body needed. So in my variation, it's a bit weird. So um, when I was in my mother's, you know, tummy, I'm not a doctor, but <laughs> my own, <laughs> my own I mean, research, you have right? first had experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my own reality. <laughs> So my body is not accepted to androgens. So when my brain was pushing out testosterone, my body was like, no, we don't want mm -hmm. this. And my body then converted it to estrogen, which means I feminized completely externally. But internally, my body was still like, but we're giving you testosterone. Why are you not accepting this? But it's because my body is, is receptive to these androgens. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, I had the internal testes with no uterus developing and no fallopian tubes, um, but on the outside, very feminizing. Yes. Um, and then, yeah, so the doctor basically told me, and then I did more research, and I found intersex groups, not in South Africa. I found groups in, like, Australia. I found groups in the U.S., and I started making connections. Mm -hmm. And th that's when I discovered I was intersex. So my entire life, like, the only thing I knew was I can't have children because mm -hmm. that's all the doctors told me, and that's it. I didn't have a diagnosis. I, I went through surgery that, you know, that I was coerced in because I just didn't know what they were talking about. Um, but then, yeah, I discovered that I'm intersex. And <laughs> you mentioned that they, they put you on HRT, which is hormone replacement yeah. therapy. Um, but I think also a very big myth or stereotype that exists within the communities and especially with heteronormative society is that intersex people are not transgender. And I think that is something we need to be very vigilant and very aware about. Um, I also wanted to ask you, what can we as a community do to bring more awareness to intersex individuals and to, you know, pave the way forward and to make people more aware of what it is your community or the intersex community needs? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, it's obviously it's really important for intersex people to have allies, right? You know, so experts estimate that with 
about 2% of the population is intersex, right? Um, but as intersex, <laughs> as intersex activists, we do dispute this because we think there are more intersex people, right? I think the 2% is just people that was based on data that they have, but they don't have data on mm, all the mm. intersex people, right? Because I think a lot of people are still scared to talk about it and yeah. to come out because we fear of being treated yeah, differently. So and with so many variations, how does one eventually identify as intersex? Because it's not just to say it's an external it's thing, mm. it's also an internal thing. Yeah. And I think that's, that's what's mind-blowing for you. You said there were 40 variants. Yeah, there's, there's, there's more than 40 variations of how someone um, could be intersex. And you know, like someone is, they are born intersex, right? And sometimes they might not know. And they just, like I said, they discover later in life. But I think that the, the main thing is for the community is to just um, recognize that that the, the problems that the intersex community is facing, right? So as we all know, when we speak about sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, and we know that gender identity is something that you choose for yourself, right? I decide my gender and that's based on me. The problem with um, intersex um, people is that a gender gets chosen for them. Mm -hmm. So a doctor will be like, oh, we think this should be a girl and they'll go to the parents and they'll say, Let's make it a goal. And this is where elective surgery comes yeah. in. Yes. That child who's born doesn't have a say whether they want to be female or male or what, whichever way they want to identify. Other people make the choices for them. And yeah. then later on in life, it might not be the right decision. Yeah, because obviously you're going to go through puberty and as intersex people, you don't know what's going to happen in your puberty. You don't know what's going to happen to your body. So many of times, like... I think the most, like in 80% of cases, doctors decide it's a goal. I think that's probably just easier for them to operate um, or, or the surgery that they have to do. Um, but most of the time they will decide, you know, it's a goal. So they would perform these surgeries on infants, right? An infant that is between zero to three years old that knows nothing about and also parents that, that knows nothing about. These surgeries, however, lead to multiple complications um, because you cannot just have one surgery. Like this, uh, every year, every five years, you technically need to go back and because things change, right? Like they have more information and it's a lifelong journey of dealing with these surgeries that you shouldn't even have had in the first place, right? So th that's one thing that intersex people face, like, you know, agenda gets chosen for them. The problem then is as they develop and they go to puberty and they bodies are, you know, developing differently. And now they have this identity that was chosen for them. And now they look a complete different person to the identity. Mm. Now they have a problem with getting legal gender recognition. Mm. So, so basically the system decides we will choose a gender for you, but now you have come into your gender as to who you are, now you have to go back to the system to prove I am what I say I am, right? And it <laughs> works completely against each other. Yeah, so they choose the gender for you, but now when you come and say, well, this is not my gender, I did not choose this, mm. you chose this for me, um, now I have a problem with getting my legal gender recognition. Now um, the system tells you that, no, you now have to prove that you are this woman or this man or whoever that you say you are. Now you have to go through all this pathologizing procedures of getting letters from doctors, from psychologists, from the community to say who you are. Just to exist. Wow. Just, just to, to exist. To exist, yeah. And then the, 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 the third issue is just the eraser and the isolation. You know, like many intersex people will not speak about being intersex because there's a lot of shame. Mm. And the shame doesn't come from intersex people. It comes from society. It comes from being marginalized. It comes from being isolated. And it comes from trying to be erased, you know, from the system. Mm. So the moment doctors do these surgeries, they don't tell you there's other people like you. They don't tell you, well, there's many variants, right? So you live your entire life growing up and thinking, thinking I am you. the only one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm the only one. And like, you're looking at yourself, you're looking at your friends, your colleagues, and you're like, I'm very different from other people. And you're thinking you are the only one. It's only when you discover that, wow, there's actually more intersex people out there, that's when you can come into your own and realize that, well, I'm not alone. There are people like me, you know, on this earth. And, but you just don't know. So now <laughs> you, you're dealing with all of this, right? You're dealing with the unconsensual surgery. You're dealing with not having your legal gender recognition. So that means you can't open a bank account, right? You can't find job. You can't find employment. Like intersex people are unemployed. And that shouldn't even be 
a, a question or a yeah. factor in any I mean, of that. Those are basic rights. Here. Exactly. Right yeah, yeah, basic yeah. rights. I want to uh, mention two things. The first thing is also, the first question is, uh, you mentioned that you found these groups in Australia and are there those groups available in South Africa now for the intersex community? Yes, um, definitely. I think w w after doing some more research, right, um, in, in a, uh, this is so funny. So um, we were all in this U.S. group and someone made a post um, right where you are from. And in that chat, two people wrote like South Africa and I wrote and I inboxed these people. Oh, and I was like, hey, I'm from, I was at, in Cape Town at that point. I'm in Cape Town and... Yeah, and we started having this conversation. And then what happened is that in South Africa, there was an existing organization called Intersex South Africa, right? Um, the founder was Sally Grass, which sa sadly Sally passed away in 2014. So Intersex was very silent in South Africa because the founder and the director passed away. Um, but then in 2017, so with social media, finding people, finding more intersex people, um, we brought together a group of intersex people, I think about 15 people in 2017 and we decided to take intersex South Africa out of its dormancy and then we were introduced to Iranti. So Iranti is a Johannesburg based organization but they work regionally and they work to promote the rights of trans, intersex and LBQ um, persons, right? And then we had this partnership with Iranti and we started promoting intersex people in South Africa. So since 2017, like for the last four or five years, there's been a lot of visibility of intersex people in South Africa and after we started Intersex South Africa, we actually formed a regional, the African Intersex Movement. So now we don't just have intersex people in South Africa, but we have a, a movement with intersex people from Malawi, from Kenya, from Nigeria. Wow. Yeah, so and, the, and uh, I'm, I'm assuming also in countries where it's still very much illegal to just be who you want to be. Yeah, like some countries, it's, it's, it's illegal to even say the word intersex. Like we know in, in Africa, we have a lot of criminalization mm. and some organizations, why you also also couldn't find them is because they would register their name under women's rights or they would register their name under children's rights because they can't use the word intersex yeah, because it's sure. still illegal in countries in Africa to use the word intersex even though these people are just born intersex you know like they didn't have a say or so but it's, it's illegal in some countries to use it but there is, is a there's a big movement of intersex people um, in Africa um, and also especially like nationally in Africa where we are trying to 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 change things for intersex people in 2019 um, the Children's Bill of Rights they called for an amendment right and as an organization we made a submission and we asked that the Children's Bill of Rights indicates that um, we need to wait until the child is of age of at least 12 to 15 where they can make a decision if On they want own. to do surgery or not. But if there's no medical risk, we need to leave the intersex child Absolutely. alone, right? Yes. Um, we made a public um, submission um, to parliament and the update came out on the bill and they've removed the intersex section. And that's what's problematic with, with our country is that... Because rather than trying to fix it or to put the effort into it to have it recognized or amend certain things, it's easier to just Dreamer. take yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the thing is, the problem is we see doctors as the experts, right? Mm. I mean, they've studied all these years and they are the expert. But if you think of everything that people deal with, how much time do they actually spend mm. on these things, right? I'm sure about intersex variations, maybe it's one day, you know, maybe it's one little portfolio that they go through. And also, a lot of them don't get the desensitization training to, you know, fully handle these types of cases. I mean, it's completely unacceptable and so concerning that there was so much secrecy around um, your experience yeah. and that no, no one was informed, no one was educated about this. In fact, you were put on display yeah. as a child yeah. in front of doctors. I mean, is there any laws that are, I don't know, yeah, that are protecting intersex people? Are these movements, can someone who is intersex go to these movements and ask for help? when they have an experience similar to yours? Yeah, definitely. So currently with Iranti, um, we have an intersex program that's focused on intersex rights. And um, we focus on the, so we call these surgeries intersex genital mutilation, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're literally mutilating body parts 
of children. And um, they do this to babies, you know, that, that, that can't give consent. And, and currently, you know, we are getting together statements and affidavits because if the Department of Health and if the Department of Social Development is not wanting to listen to us, we have no option. We have to take them to court, right? So we have to get intersex genital mutilation called unlawful, and we need to ban these surgeries. So in Malta, Malta is a very small country, but with very progressive laws. So in 2015, Malta got laws put in place that you cannot perform surgery on intersex infants up until they are 15, and they can decide with their consent if they want to do surgery or not. And we just feel that this laws make sense, right? So in 2018, we even took some of our government officials to Malta and we took them on a study tour and we like look at these progressive laws, right? Also, they have laws of self-determination. So people can just self-determine who mm. they are. We, you don't need to pathologize people. We don't have to medicalize people. They I can, can just, just come decide. and say, this is who I am. Yes. And you just have to accept me for who I am. And they have all these progressive laws and we took our government on a study tour and we're like, this, very, this laws can be implemented in South Africa very easily, right? We have this beautiful constitution, right? Some say we have one of the best constitutions but in the world. It looks but it's good on paper. On paper. Yeah. <laughs> it looks good on it's paper. It's on paper. The constitution mm. is beautiful, but it's only on paper. It's not being implemented in national levels, you know, where people are still being violated. So I think it's, it's just important that we speak about intersex and we speak we really visualize intersex people and create awareness so people are aware that, you know, these things are happening um, to children out there, you know. I think the worst thing is to think that that they are performing cosmetic surgery, you know, because it's cosmetic. Because remember, society says this is what a female should look like, this is what a male should look like. So they have these societal standards, these cosmetic standards, and they literally perform cosmetic surgery on children because they say um, your clitoris looks too big. Like this doesn't make sense. Let me ma- let let's make it look normal, normal. right? Because that's what society wants, and this is happening. Every day. If you really think about it, how disgusting is that? As an adult, you're looking at a child's genitals and you're saying, That's not this is not right. This is how it's supposed it's completely. But again, it's because we come from a generation or a society where it's like there's two binaries. Nothing in between is normal or is right. So we need to work towards that to scrap that mindset and to, like Crystal said, get those laws implemented. To have these, to have surgery if should the individual want that from the age of fifteen and up. Mm. And Chris, yeah. I want to bring into light as well. I think what is so important that that our viewers need to understand is that we have these challenges in terms of the LGBTI plus community and and moving forward. And then we have the other aspect to what you're discussing right now. This is all the personal journey, but just on the day to day, how do you even find a relationship? I mean, can, can, you, you, I mean, you are here, you are doing the fight. You are so brave. We are so empowered right now and so knowledgeable because of you and truly saluting you for take, embarking upon this journey and bringing light to this topic that none of us really know about. And I think the one thing I'm trying to bring to light is the fact that we're discussing all these details in terms of the body, but just a societal moment, a simple act of going on a first date. Mm. What does that look like for someone who's, who's, who's dealing with all of this on the inside as well? Yeah, I, I think it, 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 it's very difficult, right? Um, but I think that's also... Im- I think it's so essential, the queer community, right, that brings us all together. Because I think as, as, as the queer community, we have decided that we do not fit in society standards, right? We have decided that We don't care about binaries. We don't care about certain gender identities. We have decided that all these things are on a spectrum. I can have a gender. I can have no gender. You, you cannot tell me, right? And I think that, that, that is so important, especially for intersex people also, um, you know, to be accepted in community where, where they feel that they can be themselves, right? There's a lot of intersex people that are in different movements, right? Because remember, intersex is not a sexual orientation. It's not a gender identity. It's sexual characteristics, right? Mm-hmm. So you get intersex people that are lesbian, that are gay, that are bisexual. You can even get intersex person that identifies as being transgender because the gender was chosen for them and now they want to transition to the gender where... 
they identify as, right? So you find intersex people in all of these spaces, but often not coming out because of the secrecy and the shame of being intersex. So they would feel comfortable in the lesbian space or a gay space, but not wanting to be, hey, I am actually intersex. Um, but I think that the most important part is for intersex people to know is that like you are perfect, <laughs> you know, like you are whole, you know, like, like we know your body, um, your body gets picked apart and people try to fix you. Um, people try to normalize you, but as intersex people, you have to realize that the way you were made, that you are amazing and you are perfect and you are whole and nothing should hinder you from just living your life. You know, at the end of the day, we are all humans. We all have different experience, right? We all struggle with multiple identities. Um, we struggle with multiple violations. You know, as a transgender person, I can walk into the bank and I can be told, you're committing fraud, mm. right? Like, that's a violation. Like, I, I, as, a, as a transgender person, I can walk into home affairs and say, I want legal gender recognition. I want to change my identity. What are you running away from? What are you hiding from? You know, this is the things people ask you. And these are similar things that the intersex community faces as well. But I, I think it's just important to just be yourself and navigate space. I mean, everybody, you know, this is heteronormative mm. people are struggling with relationships. As yeah. well. <laughs> True. Sometimes even worse than that. True. I think we've learned a lot wow. from you during this episode. And I'm sure our viewers as well will take a lot from this. I want to end off this episode with speaking to you about, you guys just attended ILGA 2022 in America and we won the bid to host it in 2024 in South Africa. Please tell us a little bit more about ILGA and what does the hosting of 2024 mean for us as South Africa? Wow, yeah, it's really big. So ILGA, ILGA is a global LGBTQI plus organization, right? That basically works globally to promote rights of the entire community. Um, ILGA is also very big and they're also very powerful, um, especially with dealing with UN mechanisms. You know, at the end of the day, we all have our own human rights mechanisms in place with, in our countries, but we all know the big one is the United Nations human rights mechanisms. And sometimes these are the protocols that we have to follow and that we also have to adhere to as countries. And um, with ILGA being on this big global scale, you know, it's <laughs> they're a real big organization. Organization. And for the ILGA World um, Conference, which the gathering in 2024, um, as our organization, Iranti and Gender Dynamics, um, we did a bid to host it in 2024. Um, we were up against Argentina <laughs> and Belgium. Um, yeah, but also ILGA has not been hosted in Africa in 25 years. Oh, wow. So, yeah. so, so the it's last a big time, deal. Yeah, yeah, the last time the ILGA World Conference was on African soil was more than 25 years ago. And we were really lobbying that it's really important that the conference comes to um, South Africa. And also because of our organizations, I mean, we are led by queer, um, gender non-conforming women of color. And it's so important and essential. And something that magically happened is that while we were doing the bid, um, the organization from Belgium and from Argentina actually pulled back. Wow. wow. Yeah. So That's they were like, we're going to let you yeah. have yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, this. Let's take the conference to Africa. Wow. And they were like, that no, is. like we're pulling back. Let's go to Africa. And I mean, we're holding this big space um, with over more than like 600 plus queer people um, coming to Cape Town, which is not just good for our economy, but I mean, it's also good for our movement. Mm. And it's also good for visibility for rights in Africa and in South Africa um, as well, you know, because at the end of the day, what happens here, we can share best practice with other countries as they are on their journey to decriminalization and, you know, whatever violence relations they face in their country. So it's really important to just, you know, globalize, like bring bring the, the globe to Africa and have all um, these people here and just, you know, make change um, for our communities. Oh, that is beautiful. Yes. Crystal, thank you so much for coming on thank to WKMD so and sharing thank you. your wealth of knowledge with sure. us. We wish you all the best and we will definitely be keeping a close eye mm -hmm. on you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We need to end unnecessary medical intervention on intersex bodies and teach people that intersex people exist in all our communities. It's our responsibility to learn and read up on what we don't know. 
and what an amazing opportunity we've had here on WKMD to learn.